Welcome back to Solving Basketball. Today's guest is Neil Johnson. Neil is a sports analytics developer at ESPN. So definitely a good person to have on for what is at times a basketball analytics podcast, but he's also what I would call a hoop head, which we'll get into more on that a little bit. But thank you so much for coming on, Neil. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. So I say hoop head. I don't think there's too many uh analytics guys that, don't get me wrong there's a lot of analytics guys that that love the NBA especially and and just basketball in general but i've seen you tweet about the EYBL changing which is which for listeners that don't know is Nike's basketball AAU league grassroots league you've tweeted about them changing stats providers in the middle of the summer or foreign tours in college basketball like when uh Mega Bmax beat Michigan this summer and that, I think, is where you and I might be a little bit unique in, in the analytics world. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, my my coworkers actually always make fun of me for uh, the amount of obscure basketball I watch in their <laughs> eyes. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I love that. I love that. So for, let's before we dive into that, the first question of the podcast for every guest is if we went to a gym right now, I went under the hoop to rebound for you and you shot a hundred free throws in a row, how many would you make? So I thought about this since I I listened to the podcast. Unfortunately, where I live right now, I don't have good access to basketball hoops. So that hurts me. Um, I feel like the first 20 or so would probably be a little bit shaky, uh, but I have a good muscle memory. So if I could figure it out, then I'd be good. Um, So I'll just optimistically say it's 75 (laughs) 75 okay that's a pretty common uh a pretty common answer at this point i think andy schmidt the last guest uh, ended up going with 75 so there were a little round numbers i was hoping maybe a little bit more given given your uh (laughs) analytics developer position there's not a lot of info to go off of at this point so i can't be very precise (laughs) what is basketball what is what is what is is it basketball? Is that basketball? What is it? What is basketball? Let me ask you this then. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming you played growing up. And what, what is your basketball background? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm, I'm six foot seven. So I, I was naturally pushed into basketball. Um, I grew up playing basketball and baseball. Uh, I always tell people I was good at baseball, but I liked basketball. Um, I never really, I never really, I want you know, I played varsity sports. Uh, I played basketball for three years of varsity in high school and baseball too. Um, I never really pursued playing on the college level. I, I was, uh, I went to Ohio state, um, most of my family went to Ohio State, and that was kind of my mindset going into college was to just go to Ohio State. So in my mind, unless Ohio State wanted me for one of those two sports, I wasn't really interested in playing at the college level. Um, but I did have a couple of like low local D3 baseball offers and stuff. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I was at a small high school where being 6'7 meant you were the tallest guy on the, on the court. And we played, you know, other local small schools where all the other centers were their football centers. So they would be shorter, but probably I was a skinny guy. They probably had like 100 pounds on me. Um, So I was naturally the the tallest skinny guy that got pushed out of the paint in high school basketball. It's funny that um, we have tall, you know, seven footer shooting threes in the NBA and stuff now, because if if that happened like 10 years ago, then... Um, maybe I would have had a, cho- a, a shot to play basketball at the next level or something. <laughs> gotcha. And from that background, how did you get into the basketball and, and sports analytics world? Yeah. So, um, like I said, I went to Ohio State. Um, I got a computer science degree. Um, I always had the mindset of being a programmer growing up. Um, I've always been around computers. Um, my dad had a similar degree at Ohio State, and I was fortunate enough to always kind of have a computer in my room growing up. Uh, so I, I just naturally uh, aligned with that. Um, and then 
you know, when I was around 16, 17 year old, years old, which was around 2006, 2007, that was when uh, the in-state NBA team got this really good player called <laughs> Nate LeBron James. Um, so that, that really sparked my passion for the sport. And then at the same time, my parents have had season tickets for Ohio State basketball um, ever since they opened their new arena in 1998. Um, so I'd always been going to those games too. And at the same time, 2006, 2007, that was when they had uh, Greg Oden and Mike Conley. Um, so I always say that those are the two things that sparked my passion for basketball. Um, and yeah, in college, I you know just wanted to be a programmer coming out. I uh, just wanted to get a job. Um, and I took, you know, I took a local programming job at the state pension here in Ohio. And after a few years, that's when I started, uh, getting wind of analytics coming to basketball. Um, I think the most notable thing that, that turned me on to that was Kurt Goldsberry's shot charts and Dean Oliver's, uh, basketball and paper book. Um, once I, once I got a hold of both of those. Uh, to, you know, of the, the shot chart concept. And I read the book. I was, I was just hooked. I figured I have the programming background to maybe sidestep into this sports world. And if I could, that would be awesome. It would just be, it would just be great to, uh, you know, work on something I'm so passionate about in basketball. I would imagine that a good amount of the listeners don't have a good feel for what some of the things you might do at ESPN are. So first of all, how much is basketball compared to other sports a, a part of your job? And then maybe more specifically, what are some things that you have done with basketball? Yeah, so I work on the sports analytics team at ESPN within the stats and information group. Um, our team largely focuses on both college basketball and NBA and college football and NFL. Um, we're kind of in a, in a sweet spot where everybody kind of gets to focus on the sports that they're passionate about. And we're a small enough team that everybody has um, slightly different uh, sports that they prefer. So that's where I, I get to be in, mostly in charge of our NBA stuff. Um, and then I get to help out with the college basketball stuff and the other sports as well. Um, what I always tell people, the easiest way to, to see our work is on the bottom line. If you ever see for one of those sports, a percent chance to win number, um, that is a number generated from one of our models And what we call our models are the power indexes. So if you hear basketball power index or football power index, those are the main things that our group, uh, creates and runs, um, Outside of that, I mean, we do all sorts of little things here and there. Um, like you've seen some of my, I've run some, you know, I have the, the EYBL AU passion, I guess. So I've been able to use that to fuel some articles on uh, ESPN Plus, I guess is what it's now called. Um, and yeah, a whole bunch of different things. Yeah, so let's get into that. I saw you have two papers that listeners will definitely be interested in. One is called Evaluating the Predictability of Shooting from Grassroots Basketball to the Next Level. So again, Grassroots Basketball is the sneaker circuits, AAU. And then another one is called Projecting College Basketball Freshman Performance Using Grassroots Stats. So we talked about this with on the podcast with Jesse Bopp. I think it was two podcasts ago. You're at this point, pretty much the expert uh, on this, I know Drew Cannon was trying to do stuff like this for Brad Stevens at Butler before he ended up moving to the NBA. I guess he probably still is doing it just privately. You also had an article on ESPN, how AAU metrics predicted success of Robert Williams. So th there has been some public stuff. What have you learned in all that research? Yeah, so I mean, the whole goal of that is, um, you know, if you're a part of basketball analytics, you're very aware of, uh, I guess, NBA Twitter's fascination with uh, NBA draft models. Um, so that's just a, a numerical approach to rating players in the NBA draft. And once I, I realized that these shoe circuits and some of the major high school basketball events were keeping box scores and publicizing them, 
Um, I figured we could do the same thing translating uh, high school talent to the college level. So that's that, that was kind of the goal of those two papers. Um, at this point, I would say the, you know, using advanced stats, I guess the one that I'm most preferential to is box plus minus. Um, that one is, it, it, it depends on how you slice and dice it, but in general, a good rough rule is that it's roughly as good as a scout's rating of a player. So if you go to ESPN.com and they have a, not the ranking, but the number next to their name, if they're like a, you know, 0.98, they're like a five star, that type of thing. Um, if you look at how those numbers project to a, a, a player's freshman season, and then you look at how box plus minus for these grassroots leagues project to their freshman season, they're actually pretty comparable. Um, the Sky Rains are definitely a little bit better. Um, credit to them. They do a really good job, you know, all of them, not just these can, you know, everybody, you know, travels to all the events, sees the players in person. They do do a really good job of, you know, putting them in the right order and then, you know, putting them on scales of like, you know, like a, like a Kevin Durant is a once in a 10 year type player, that type of thing. Um, but that's where I think what can help is combining the two um, to make sure that you are missing anything. And then the other part of it is scout ratings. They do a really good job for ranking the top 100, but about a thousand players enter college as freshmen every year. Um, and all of them obviously don't play in these, you know, high major shoe circuits, um, but about like 500 of them do. <laughs> so like what I've found is like using box plus minus to project how they'll translate is consistent one to four to 500 deep versus just the scout ratings that only are really consistent one to 100. And that makes sense because those guys only they're human beings They can only travel to so many games and watch so many players. And after a certain point, if they try to watch every single player, um, mentally, they're going to be fatigued. They're going to expose themselves to having biases, like to treat your, your first evaluation, um, the same way you would as your hundredth. Whereas with your hundredth, you might be tired, you might be sleepy. Like there's just a couple of things there that would make it really hard to do that. Um, or, you know, you could have a team of scouts, but every scout looks at things slightly differently. And then you, you would have to make sure that you're accounting for it that way. And that's just, that's kind of a big ass. Um, so having a numerical approach, there's, there's less biases there and it's going to be consistent across the board. Um, so that, that's where we're pretty much at with this stuff. Um, there's a lot of, a long way to go with this stuff. Uh, the, the reason why you see me tweeting out a lot of that stuff about the box scores is because they don't, while they do post them, they're not always um, consistent in how they post them. They're not always easy to digest, you know, scrape, put in a, a database, that type of stuff. Um, so that's, that's always a challenge. Um, and yeah, I, you know, at some point, I think th as the stats become more and more available as you know, it, it'd be really nice if we had play-by-play -play for these events. Um, it'd be nice if we had the, uh, you know, a, a lot of these events, I'm 99% I'm sure it's just, you know, it's just a parent keeping track of the, you know, the stats. Um, that's no, uh, uh, no offense to them, but they're not going to be as good as someone who's doing it for college or someone who's doing it for MBA. They're just doing it because someone needs to do it. Um, so the stat keeping quality could go up as well. Um, so it's just one of those things. And then like these leagues are only, they're only like seven, six, seven years old, like the, the Nike one. Um, but then even the Adidas and Under Armour one are only four or five years old. Um, so that's, that's kind of a small sample size to, to look at. Whereas, you know, for like the NBA draft, you have however many years of drafts to go off of and however many years of there being a three point one and the game being officiated the way it is now. Um, so it's something that I, you know, I, at this point I see it as it's a good start. There's definitely some easy wins that could be done now. Um, and I'm looking forward to, you know, kind of maintaining that updating the stats each year by year and 
finding small ways to improve. I want to get into the part you're saying about data inaccuracy or, or, or that type of thing, but let's go back for a second. You mentioned how box plus minus is what you use. The one thing that worries me is it can be pretty hard for coaches that feels like a black box number. It's just one number. They don't necessarily know how we got there. Uh, so could you, if you were explaining box plus minus to a coach, what, what would that explanation be? Yeah. So, I mean, box plus minus can simply just be seen as, I mean, it's, it's a per 100 possession stat and it's just, it's a number that combines all of the contributions that a player does and puts them in a, a plus minus form per 100 possessions. So you could look at it as simply if a player has a 10 box plus minus, um, they are adding 10 points per 100 possession over an average player. So what you're kind of doing there is you're, you're factoring out um, how many possessions are in a game because not every game is played at the same pace. And you're, you're, you're centering it on the average player. So average is zero. Um, and anything above that is good. So that's where it should just be, a, you know, it's, I mean, a lot of people are familiar with PER. So a lot of the times I kind of compare it in the context of PER. Um, PER is a similar type number, although I think it's centered around like 13 or 14. Um, but that number was, you know, PR was definitely designed for the NBA game. It was it was designed for an 82 game season. Um, it was designed for like I think 13 times like five, or I forget. Like it a adds up to the average score I think per 100 possessions that type of thing. Um, so there's just a couple of things there that make me want to lean towards um, box plus minus. Um, I mean, yeah, that's just how I would kind of phrase it to coaches um, usually I don't <laughs> you can I'll, I'll give you the answer but I imagine with most coaches there's there's a dialogue there because there's always going to be little parts that they aren't um, sure of and you just have to be willing to answer all those things right I totally agreed and then if you were to somehow try to almost break it out your paper where you have the evaluating the predictability of shooting just shooting in particular or the thing that everyone says is rebounding translates. Have, have you looked at individual skills to see from grassroots to the D1 level, how they translate? Yeah. So at this point, the only things that I'm really confident to kind of share as like, this is something that is consistently translate are free throw rate, uh, free throw rate and three point attempt rate. So basically, um, how often does a player get to the line and how many twos do they shoot versus threes? I guess what I've seen there is, or what would be good advice for coaches is it's probably like an uphill bat. Like if you have a, a center or an undersized center and you want them to start shooting threes in college and they aren't shooting threes currently, it's probably going to be an uphill battle to kind of change their, how they approach their shot selection um, and then same thing for, you know, if you have, you know, James Harden's known for his free throw rate. If you have a guard that you want to just start driving to the hoop more and drawing more fouls, if that's not already in his game, that's something that it, it'll, it might be a challenge to, to really develop that in that player. Um, everything else at this point, it isn't, I'm, I'm not confident enough to say other things consistently translate though well. And that's where I think, what the thing I need to look at next is to start comparing how well the how how well certain stats translate per team or per coaching staff, because that's the thing I think will happen is certain teams are better at developing shooting. Certain teams are better at um, you know putting their players in positions to succeed. Obviously, whatever it is, um, and then certain teams aren't, or they ask their players to do things that are much different than what they were doing in high school. And it doesn't work out well. Um, and that's where, you know, 
there's what 351 teams now or 53 teams in division one so it's just such a, a, a vast array of teams on different levels with different styles so it's kind of hard to um consistently say much else translates consistently at this point yeah that's fascinating and if we can measure these players at the aau level better then we can start measuring coaches better because we know they're like base talent level that they're getting. So it's all related. It'll be hard to ever determine uh, causation necessarily, but it would potentially help us evaluate player development and stuff like that, like you said. Another area of the basketball world that we have talked about is junior college. And again, Anyone in the junior college world that's listening to this, I'm sure when you mention the stats being a little uh, messy, <laughs> we're, we're all like, yep, it's the same for junior college too. <laughs> we have both looked at trying to do things with the, the stats on njcaa.org. What are your experiences with that? Yeah, we, we've definitely talked about this uh, offline before, for <laughs> sure. Um, it's, it's definitely kind of the wild, wild west there. Um, and I guess for anybody who's tried to look at AU stats or has only tried to look at junior college stats, the issues that there are with both are largely the same. Um, the thing, the thing with the, the junior college stats is, 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 as I understand it, is it's entirely up to the, the teams themselves to post their stats. Um, my friend, uh, Luke Stregge, who coaches Mineral Area College, I asked him about that because I was like, hey, if like what's what's going on here? It, I just need to understand this a little bit better. And he's like, yeah, it's it's entirely up to us what we want to put in. Um, and, that, you know, it kind of is that way on the major college level and the NCAA. Um, but the, the NCAA just has much more infrastructure in place to error check, to, you know, course correct, all those types of things. <laughs> so even if a, a coach wanted to, slightly changes the stats or something there's there's some there's there's some checks in place um but yeah that's we've talked about it that's another it's another room or area for improvement um if anyone you know is listening to this podcast and is looking for ways to stand out themselves it would probably you know be this would be a great way to do it would be to just find some way i mean honestly just having a good stat repository set up for junior college where college coaches can look at the stuff um, in a much more uh, streamlined way is, is already something that doesn't exist now. But then on top of that, um, you know, gleaning insight on top of that, using advanced stats, all of that type of stuff is, would also be great. Um, the one, I think the one main difference between like the high school grassroots stuff and junior college is since every junior college is posting their own stats, Every time they play an opponent who may not be in NJCAA, so it could be like California colleges, it could be the the small college JV teams in the NAIA, um, it could be that there's some there's some like amateur teams that'll play these schools, and then like prep schools too, I guess. If those non junior college teams play multiple junior college teams, their player names are going to be very different per box score. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely not, not super easy to work with. <laughs> yeah. I spent a good chunk of my summer trying to work with it and, uh, minutes is, re- is really the, the biggest problem is that there's no, yeah. there's no consistent minutes going in. Sometimes it's just anyone who played is given one minute. Sometimes just the starters are, are given their 40 and, but one thing that we did do at New Mexico State, we took a lot of junior college kids there. We didn't necessarily look at the stats themselves, but there are junior college rankings, kind of like you were talking about with, with the ESPN or, or whoever for the for the top 100. There's, there's a junior college top 100, and mm-hmm. so we used that player pool and broke it down by height, and one trend, and it's... I would say just how you said you would only feel comfortable with free throw rate and three point rate. I don't know if this trend is something that I should feel comfortable sharing, but I'm going to do it anyways. (laughs) 
junior college bigs that went high major transferred at a ridiculously high rate eventually from from that high major. And I think there could be some reasons for that. A lot of times you're taking a junior college kid because you're you need you just need a big. It's more out of necessity than than want. So that was without looking at stats, just looking at outcomes basically, if they transferred or if they played a certain amount of minutes at the at the D one level. That was that was one thing that we looked at. No, that that's really smart. That's another way to look at things is um you know, like a lot of the work we just talked about uh from the two posters I did was about predicting, but, um, you know, predicting how future performance, um, and in your situation there, you're projecting outcomes where, um, you know, that's, that's kind of where we're at with this stuff that hasn't, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of new, new, uh, areas to explore is you're not, you, not everything's clear cut and dry and easy to, easy to do, easy to work with, easy to understand. And that's where, um, even if you can just get an insight such as like, well, just like it, it just by looking at the numbers here, it, it's not going to typically work out if we try to get this type of guy in this type of situation, or rather if a coach is very passionate about a certain guy that does fit those same qualifiers. So let him know that like, it might, you know, you might be very confident in this working, but there are other, uh, sources of information saying that it's not. So you need to be very aware of that, that this might not go the way you want to go. So either, you know, work harder in that, you know, in that specific situation to make it better, or, you know, maybe possibly go a different route. You know, if you have a 1A and a 1B and the 1A is a, a guy that, that, you know, a, a big trying to go to a high major, um, maybe you go with the one B because they're roughly about the same in the coach's mind, but the other situation might have a, a greater chance for success. The other thing that I, I mentioned drew cannon in earlier, and he had a article that I wanted to get your opinion on. It's something that I've sent to some coaches in the past. It was about this whole recruiting thing. And it's from a, a while back now, uh, I think it was on basketball prospectus. I don't want to misquote them, but but the general concept was that in recruiting evaluations, evaluators are trying to fit certain stereotypes almost. So the guys yeah. that slip through the cracks are the ones who maybe aren't a common position, either offensively or defensively. So he wanted to get people away from someone being a one, a two, a three, a four, or a five, but what are they on offense? What are they on defense? Are they a rim protector? Are they a floor spacer? More trying to to look at them skill-wise than the traditional positional narrative. Are you, are you familiar with that article? I'm actually not, but um, I, I really like what you said there, or I, I like the general gist of it. I think it was a little bit what Butler was doing. And I think he wrote it before he did anything for Brad Stevens, but they would have like an undersized five man an undersized four man who the, the highest of high majors of the world are, they just can't necessarily see them as the perfect seven footer. Who's going to block shots. And that's a way to get some undervalued guys. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's really smart. Um, what, what Drew's doing there is he's looking at how how evaluators evaluate and where there they, there might be gaps in their evaluations. Um, and that's that's where it comes to. Like if you, I imagine if you talk to these guys that go to all of these games and stuff, it's just such a grind and it's such a it's such a large task. So that's where, nat- I mean, it's it's natural for any human to in general, just um, kind of put things into certain frames of reference that they've seen before in their life. Um, so, I mean, it totally makes sense there that scouts, and I mean, so that article is old. So I'm sure scouts in general have also updated their um, their approach to things and have improved, you know, in, over time, obviously. Um, and the game's changed a lot, actually, too. But yeah, like it, it would make sense that they were like, well, you see a one, two, three, four, five. Um, those are the types of things um, fans want to know, coaches want to know. And that's where it totally makes sense that that's where Butler 
you know, found, you know, was able to overachieve in the talent that they got is one that they could get these guys that were overlooked because they didn't have the physical attributes that matched their position um, or their offensive and defensive sides weren't the same. And then B, that they were aware that that was the case and they needed to approach their their game planning according to that as well. Um, the other thing with that is just I I understand that you know college coaches have finite resources and only have so much time to kind of do all of this due diligence. And that's where they do just want to know is he a one, two, three, four, or five? Um, and somehow Butler found a way to kind of you know, under Brad Stevens, found a way to um, exploit those advantages that other teams were. Yeah, you've mentioned several times about one of the keys to analytics, really, is that the, the numbers are watching everything versus evaluators are just watching whatever they can fit in their 24-hour day. I mm-hmm. think the way most coaches supplement that is just by talking to tons and tons of people that are around that person. Hopefully, opinions of which they respect that's that's generally the way but analytics would be another great way too let me ask you this there's a podcast i think podcast radio show called wharton moneyball and they ask all their guests who usually work for teams of these three problems what is holding you back it's data scarcity which is what we talked about or data inaccuracy and sometimes in, in our case a, a stats problem, like your model is not good enough, or a management problem, like for college basketball, it's getting buy-in from the coaches. So we talked a good amount about the, the scarcity thing, but if there was one piece of data that you could have for anything in basketball, the the floor is yours, what would that data be? Uh, I mean, for me personally, it would be player track a player tracking data set for all 353 teams um, that is very expensive only maybe four or five teams have it now um, but with my day-to-day job at ESPN um, I'm working with the player tracking data in the NBA a lot and a lot of times I just have questions of like oh well because you know they're very different games with a different set of rules and stuff and I'm like oh well it'd be interesting in college if we had this to you know, look into this. Um, I mean, that's something that I think eventually the technology for that stuff, um, the technological hurdle and the financial hurdle will get very low in the next decade. And it'll be very easy for at least the high majors. So I'll have some sort of player tracking data set. Um, but that's the one for me personally, I think would be the most interesting. Um, the one with respect to like projecting, college freshman performance or just performance for college players, whether they're transfers, junior college transfers or incoming freshmen, um, obviously would be, you know, good, clean, consistent box scores from wherever they're coming from. But the other hurdle I think would be good, um, you know, height and weight and wingspan measurements, you know, combine type stats, those types of things. Um, at this point, you can you can get the height of a player on the ESPN Top 100 Scout, you know, 24/7 Sports stats types of things, but it's just it's all over the board in terms of accuracy. Um, it's one of those things that I've been kind of I don't have much pool by any means, but every time I, I get a chance to talk to a college coach or somebody around college basketball, I try to try to feed this uh, into their ear. It's with these these uh, NCAA run basketball camps next summer. Um, I really want them to do combine testing and to publish those numbers. I feel like that would be, there's been a lot of, um, you know, criticism and concern of the new summer model with respect to recruiting and the live periods and all of that stuff. I think one benefit you could get would be um, measuring these players, weighing them, doing the combine type stuff. Um, I mean, and that, and that would really help out my stuff. That would help us all rating and evaluating the players. But I think it would also have benefit for the players themselves because um, it's just another way to compare yourself to your peers. And um, 
I don't know, we ask a lot of these kids coming to college basketball, but it would be another way for them to see, you know, at the same time, we also build them up sometimes more than we should. And this would be another way for them to see, hey, my, you know, my, I have a short wingspan or versus everybody else that I'm, I'm comparing myself to, or, you know, my, my vertical isn't as high as it should be, or my strength could be a little bit better, those types of things. Um, I think it's just something if we're going to have all of these um, selected recruits come to these camps that are run by the NCAA, we might as well do some some consistent measuring of them. And then on the other hand, going back to the Wharton Moneyball thing that they do, now based off of the data or based off of whatever, anything that you have, what do you think is not being bought into enough by by coaches or it could be an NBA front office thing or, or um, obviously I'm more geared towards the, the college coaching world, but is there something that might be lagging behind what the data or analytics say? Um, I guess at this point, I kind of, what I've kind of seen through doing all of the projecting college freshman performance stuff is that <clears throat> the stats are actually a, a really good indicator of, I mean, they're obviously a good indicator of who's, who's better than who, um, but it's actually like a good indicator of who's, who's good from the start, so to speak. Like the last two summers, what I've seen is who's the, like, who are the best statistical performers after the April live periods are the ones that, start getting offered by the blue bloods um around the july periods um so i you know i understand that and, and the recruiting challenge is part of it is understanding you know when do you offer one is it like if you offer what everybody else offer there's that whole mind game element to it um but i think what a lot of people could do now especially um teams with more limited resources is, I mean, you could, I I just think a lot of the recruiting could be augmented by your approach to recruiting could be augmented by stats. Um, If you're trying to fill specific needs, you could look at players stats across the board to find players that are had a similar statistical makeup as the player you're trying to replace. Um, If you're a team that, is looking to exploit advantages of, you know, finding undersized centers that play really well or finding good point guards that don't shoot really well, but get to the hole, those types of things. Um, You could find those guys that on the court are performing just as well as the guys who are getting all the exposure, those types of things. Um, But, you know, I just, I just, you know, I kind of understand there is the, the resource challenge to kind of doing all this stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty much that. And just, there's, you know, just the general understanding of all of the different types of advanced stats and what they mean and how they should be used. Um, there's always slightly an issue. I mean, even with the coaches that are, are all in, so to speak with the analytics, not all of them, they don't have enough time. So they don't understandably fully understand everything about each stat so that's where they kind of get into well does this does this number answer my question yes or no and they'll ask that to like you or i or somebody who's running the you know the analytics operation for a team and the answer is it's it's not a yes or no it's not that simple um and that's where you kind of have to understand context with things i mean like the most simple version of this is just like small sample size things where you, you shouldn't, you know, after two games, you shouldn't assume that the shooting percentage or breakdown for a player is going to stay that way across the whole season. It's, you know, it's too small sample size. Um, but that's where, like, I guess the, or the actual example I see with coaches kind of getting overconfident on is, um, like, lineup efficiencies, lineup plus minus. Though after a game, they'll be like, oh, well, this lineup was – way better than our starting lineup we should switch to that going forward or something and it's just like a like a raw plus minus number how many points did it score how many of the opponents score um it's just it's not it's unfortunately it's not that simple it's not 
reliable enough to work off of just like a one game sample off of a even like a four or five game sample there's just a lot of variance there it's it's variance in opponent um it's there's just there's all different factors like the one issue a lot of analytics and basketball kind of struggle with that might be um more easy to understand is just like for deep, you know, defense is obviously hard to like understand in general, but one specific element of it is like contested, you know, defense against three point shooting. There's just, it's such a, it's, it's hard to parse out like, well, did the contest affect the shot or did the player just make or miss the shot for jump shots? It's just so much less important that you can test it versus a shot around the rim. So that's where it's very hard to understand if the contest affected a three-point shot or not. So what happens is your three-point uh, shooting defensive percentage number is very noisy. So like the, the other team could have just missed the shots whether or not it was contested or, you know, it's, it's just hard to break that element out. So that's one of those things where, um, you know, shooting defense in general is not as consistent of a thing that you would want to look at as you might think. Um, one thing people should probably do is instead of looking at like, oh, well, like, let's say you had one game where you're, you're, you're three, you know, so very simply, let's say after one game, the other team shot like 30%. And instead of thinking, oh, well, we're good at defense, you need to look at it as, well, they did not shoot well. You know, you need to look at it as that happened in the past, not that this is some this is some indicator that we can rely on going forward, you know? So that's like, there's just little things like that um, where coaches are like, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking for the answer. Does this give me the answer? Yes or no. Um, and it's just something that there, there has, there needs to be context. There needs to be a discussion around it. Um, it's just not as simple as yes or no, this player is better than this player, those types of things. Yeah, that's great. And maybe the difference between, someone on a college staff that has a Kempom subscription and to be fair, understands all, you know, knows that rebounding margin is bad, knows stuff like that, but doesn't necessarily have the technical training or, or yeah. to be frank, do it for a living like you do where everything is, is put into context about the predictability of it going forward. That's for sure something that could be lacking on a staff. One example I'll give that's way more specific. Yours were better answers to the question than, than this, but just something very specific on the floor that I've got I've talked to a couple coaches about in the last year or two is so for the most part we're coming we've begun to come to an agreement in the basketball community that at least a lot of mid-range shots are bad. So if it's yeah. Uh, late in the shot clock, you might need to take a mid range. If you have someone who's really, really good at shooting mid range, they might need to take mid ranges. There, they, there's nuance to it. It's not, it's not a yes or no thing. But one place where it seems like in the coaching community, it's welcome to take mid ranges. Where I would push back on is baseline out of bounds plays. So, for whatever reason, th there can be like. 20 to 30 seconds still on the clock. I'm not talking about late shot clock baseline out of bounds, but just regular baseline out of bounds. Every team in the country, it seems like, has a screen the screener baseline out of bounds play that leads to a mid-range jump shot. That's the primary option off of that play. And in talking to coaches, their counter argument is for whatever reason, since it's it's that play is designed for a shooter. He knows his job. He knows what he's what he's got to do, and they feel like he shoots a better percentage be, because of that than in, in the flow of the game. I would say that that play should probably be either designed for a three or designed for a layup. You have total control over it because it's a dead ball. So I prefer baseline out of bounds plays that try to get a layup or. There are some that just like get really good spacing and then and then you play from there. What are your thoughts on the the coaching counter argument that like this guy shoots really well in that specific situation? I mean, that's what you're kind of seeing with the Spurs now is they have they have mid-range shooters that 
um, on average shoot almost 50% from the mid range. And then if they're wide open, they, you know, that bumps up to like, you know, two thirds of the time they make it that type of thing. Um, the one thing I always like to frame this in is like how many points per shot are you getting? And that's where you can evaluate all of the different types of shots, you know, like effective field goal percentage is the same thing. It's just that times how many points you would make. Um, and that's where, yeah, obviously, if you're going to have a wide open three, that number will be close. It'll be close to three, depending on the shooter, but it'll be almost like a guaranteed two points. Um, and then same if it's like a wide open way up under the hoop or it's like an alley -oop dunk for someone you can catch the lob. Um, and that's where if uh, you have, I mean, if you have a mid-range shooter who is exceptional from the mid-range and you can get him a wide open mid-range shot and you think that's the best out-of-bounds play you have or the best out-of-bounds play you have in that moment, um, I guess that's fine. But you're right. In terms of, in general, um, over the long run, um, you shouldn't be designing plays that do that. You should be designing plays that get you uh, you know, dunks and three open three point shots. Um, like if you're in the off season and you're like, all right, we need to overhaul our ATOs. Um, those are the, like the thing, those are the outcomes you should be going for. Um, and yeah, that's the other thing to consider is a, you know, an ISO contested two point shot with five seconds on the shot clock is fine. So that if you had, if you had a mid range shooter that, you know, shoots, exceptionally well from that area um that can give you the confidence to know like well if, if the play breaks down we just need to let everybody know that person needs to get the ball because he will shoot the worst he will shoot the worst shots better than the average player totally yeah and you should be doing things in your offense to try to avoid that scenario needing to score with five seconds left on the clock in an iso situation but even the best offenses that happens and and from there i completely agree a, a mid-range shot is is needed and then the the flip side of the baseline out of bounds thing is that i think it's almost like a coaching people trying to out coach each other everyone is like on game days you you go over everyone's baseline out of bounds plays and shoot around like that's that's a pretty common thing sometimes coaches are so concerned with taking away the baseline out of bounds play, trying to make sure they don't get a shot out of it. The other team out coach the coach that maybe they should be thinking more like, do I want them to take this shot? Like maybe we're okay with that in defense in general. I think that the best coaches, the best defensive coaches are more so than trying to out coach the other coach. They're just trying to force the worst expected value. Like we were talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's where, like, yeah, expected value is another way to look at it. Um, and that's where you kind of have to, looking through through that lens, you'll look for, you're looking for optimal plays, like optimal ways to play the game. So it might not, you know, it's not, and I guess that's the other thing with ATOs is like, a, it might you might really need that shot in that moment. So the sample size is one. So you kind of just need to do what you think is going to work. So I understand the thought logic there. But in general, when you're trying to teach the game, design your game plan, um, you know, play a whole season worth of games, you need to look for basically what I say is like optimal plays. Like what is the optimal decision to do in each moment? Um, in each game situation, what would be the optimal thing to do next? It's not always going to, you know, if you, if you always do the optimal thing, you're not going to make every single shot, but over the run of the, you know, the course of the season, you're going to perform a little bit better than just doing, um, you know, doing whatever you think might make sense without considering the numbers, the scouting, you know, all of the sources of information you have. Agreed. And thank you so much for your time. For anyone that is new to Neil, uh, well, first of all, what is your Twitter handle, Neil? Uh, it's Neil M. Johnson. Got it. So Neil M. Johnson. 
I think you can tell from this conversation that he is a skilled analyst, especially at developing things that, that are used on ESPN, but also has a really good basketball background and the nuance to talk these things through. So definitely follow him on Twitter and, and thank you so much for your time, Neil. Hey, Jordan, I appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. No hand checking Michael Jordan, Scott Pippen, Tony Kuko.